ever said something that you regretted? <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe when, when, when you first said it, you didn't realize it, you know? You, you, you said something and, and then you got home and as Ron pointed out, that lovely wife or that husband of yours kind of said, you know, dear, when you said that they were hoping they'd get a leg up, you should have realized the guy was missing a leg. <laughs> and you go, oh, yeah, I didn't even, because I'm good at that. My wife just, yeah, um, I'm, I, we had, a, we had a, a, a friend of ours one time that their dog was killed and, and my exclamation was, I Chihuahua, you want to guess what type of dog it was? <laughs> and she looks at me like, how could you be so unfeeling? And I went, what? <laughs> yeah, I didn't get it. I, and then it <laughs> dawned on me, oh, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I do those things. And, and she just kind of cuts me the look like, you know, it would be insulting, except that you're so, you don't get it, you know? <laughs> And so we get home, I get it, and I go, okay, well, I don't get it, but I get it, you know. <laughs> Sometimes we say things, um, and we don't intend for them to be harsh, or we don't intend for them to be offensive. You know, we, we say something, and, and, and it strikes a nerve in another person. And we find out later on that, you know, the person's offended or upset or whatever, and and Ken, you're probably going to want to turn me down just a little bit more. Yeah, sorry, buddy. Um, and I probably ought to turn this thing off because my nasty daughter who is in California right now is sitting on the beach sending me pictures of the ocean. <laughs> and so I, I sent her a message back and said, no, 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 not fair. Uh, so y'all let her know that can you guys hear me okay? What? Up a little bit more. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, that's good. I don't need to hear myself, but you need to be able to hear me. Anyway, uh, sometimes we say things and we strike a nerve with a person, and it's only sometime later. And, I, and I've even seen cases where it's been years later that somebody finally kind of confronts a person and says, everything was going so well with us, what happened? And they'll say, well, you said this. And you go, well, I didn't mean it that way. And, you know, you, you kind of work it out. But, you know, you've, you've missed out on a lot of fellowship because of that. And then sometimes you say things. And the minute you say them, the minute you say them, you're almost like this. You know, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. You go to grab them back and... You know, saying words is like squeezing toothpaste out of a, out of a, a roll. You try putting it back in, you know. It doesn't, it doesn't work real well, you know. It gets all over the place. Well, I'll tell you what. Let me, <clears throat> let me tell you, I'm going to do something this morning that I, to the best of my knowledge, have never done. Okay? I've been accused of it a lot of times, but I've never done it. I've had people come up to me and say, you wrote that message just for me. Okay? And to the best of my knowledge, I have never done that until today. And this message is about somebody, and it's about me. Because last Sunday, I stood in this pulpit, and I said something that I shouldn't have said. I said, Joel, was a liar. I should have never said that. Now, those of you that are saying in your heart, but he is, okay? I, sh I, I shouldn't have said it. You know? It, it, it's not that I shouldn't have said it because I might have offended somebody. And it's not that I shouldn't have said it because you don't say those sort of things in public. It's not that I shouldn't have said it because it's somehow socially unacceptable to say. I mean, I always like it when somebody said, you called me a liar. And I go, well, did you lie? Yeah, but don't call me a liar. <laughs> okay? Um, it's not because it's, it's somehow socially unacceptable to lie. It's because of this simple fact. I claim to be a follower of Christ. Okay? I claim to surrender my life to Jesus. And then I went and did something that grieves God's heart. And that is to speak unkindly of another person. If you take a look in, in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29 in particular, the book of Ephesians, Paul's writing to these believers about living as imitators of Christ. If you read through the whole book, and I, I, you know, I, I, I certainly hope that, uh, that you do that. If you take a look over in chapter 1, beginning in verse 4, he says, Just as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless 
before him in love, he predestined us to adoption as his sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will to the praise of, his, the, of the glory of his grace which he has freely bestowed on us. He talks to them about, you know, demonstrating who God is and evidencing his goodness and his character. And he talks about that in a lot of, a lot of, uh, of areas. But when he gets to verse 29, he mentions one in specific. And this is why what I said was wrong. It says, let no unwholesome words uh, proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need, so that it will give grace to those who hear. And my words were unwholesome. I, I am told that, you know, God does not ever speak a harsh word. You realize that? God never speaks a harsh word. And you go, wait a minute, preacher. You know, that judgment stuff in the Old Testament, that's pretty harsh. How can you say that, that God doesn't speak a harsh word? Well, you know what? When I go to my doctor, my doctor looks at me and says, Brother, you're fat. Okay? You're overweight, or as they like to be tactful and say, you're a little obese. Okay? Little obese. You're kind, Doc. But if he just looked at me and said, Jim, you're, you're just, you're fat. I prefer to look at it as gravitationally challenged, but we'll go with that one. That may seem harsh. And maybe, you know, maybe he is being mean. You know what the difference between being mean and being helpful is? Why is he telling me this? He's not telling me that I'm, I'm fat just because he wants to, well, I've got a check sheet. See how many of my patients I can hack off today. There's one, you know. Said, Doc, you may say I'm fat. I want a second opinion. You're ugly too. There's another one, you know. But yeah, you know, odds are what I take as being harsh is his intent to do good. His intent to help me. And we look at the Old Testament and go, well, God's awful harsh in what he does. You know, God's not harsh. There's not a harsh bone in God's body if he had a body like you and me. What God does, God does in order to benefit humanity. And sometimes he tells us stuff we don't want to hear. A lot of times he tells us stuff we don't want to hear. But it's not because he's trying to be mean. He's not trying to be harsh. It's that he's doing it out of, out of love. He's doing it, as Paul told the church there in chapter 1, out of, out of his glory. Well, if I'm a Christ follower, then I ought to be the same way. But see, what's kind of happened over the centuries is that rather as a Christ follower looking at God and saying, you know, I ought to be like him, I act a certain way in my flesh, and then everybody thinks that's the way God is, right? Right? Rather than being created in God's image, haven't we ended up making people think God is created in our image? Well, God's harsh. Why? Because we're harsh. I need to get back to the proper order of things. And I need to understand that I don't want to grieve God's heart. And if I don't want to grieve God's heart, then no unwholesome words should come out of my mouth. No unwholesome words. I want you to kind of ponder that word unwholesome for a minute. Okay? Because really, to be honest, when I think of wholesome, I think of bread that they used to make in Phoenix, okay? And you drive down Interstate 10 about Buckeye Road, and I don't care if it was the middle of summer and 120 degrees, you rolled the windows down. And you... And gained 10 pounds. But it was worth it. It was worth it, okay? So I don't know that I, I really understand what, what wholesome is. What do I mean by, by wholesome? What God means by wholesome is this. Is it generally accepted, is it generally understood that Christians don't cuss, don't gossip, don't speak harshly? Generally, do we accept that? Okay, can we be in agreement that, okay, that's, you know, if you're a Christian and you go, blankety blank, I love blankety blank God so blankety blank much, that people are probably going to look at you and go, you know, that just doesn't sound right. But why? 
Because what I said just a few minutes ago, because the very nature of God is not to speak harshly or to speak uh, crassly, but to speak with a purpose. The purpose of God is to speak to edify others. God tells us what sin is because sin's a bad thing and sin harms us. Little kid, run through the house with a pair of scissors. Ah! Mom says, don't run through the house with those scissors. What do I do? Yeah. Run through the house with the scissors. Ah! You know why? Because I don't get it. So she takes the scissors from me, grounds me to my room. You know, I, next time I find the scissors. Ah! And then it dawns on me one day. Wow, them bad boys go right through me. That's probably why I not run with them scissors. Well, that's the way it is with God. God says, don't run through life with them scissors. And we go, what? I don't get it. Ah! And then one day the light comes on and we go, oh, that'll hurt me. Everything that God does, he does for his glory and for our benefit. And we need to listen to that. And we need to understand wholesomeness in, in that way. When God speaks, even in judgment, he always speaks to his glory, to our benefit, in order to enrich us and to enhance us. When, when Paul says here to this church, do not speak unwholesome words, he's saying don't speak words that have little to no use in edifying another person. Okay? Don't throw stuff out there that, that, that doesn't help them. Now please, don't go to the extreme and say, you mean we can't tell jokes? we can't tell jokes and ground me in my room. Please ground me to my room. Okay? I mean, I'm not saying we can't talk about football. I'm not saying we can't talk about basketball. Especially in March, right? How many of y'all are following the brackets? How many of your brackets are busted? Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying we can't talk about stuff like that. What I am saying is that, you know what? Maybe we ought to give some thought to what we speak and not just run our mouth. But realize that, you know, words have power. You have the potential to bless and curse people. And we've lost that connection. We've lost the ability to understand that I can enhance somebody by what I say. Or I can impede them by what I say. And I need to, I need to understand, if I'm a Christ follower, if, if my life belongs to the Lord, if I say that he is my Savior then he speaks with purpose and with intent. He doesn't just speak to hear himself like we kind of like to do. Paul says our words should be wholesome words. Words that are meant for, for edification, for the uplifting, for the benefit, for the profit of other people. But he goes on, on to say, okay, only such words, take a look there, as is good for edification, and then according to the need. Is that kind of, you know, you see that there? You following with me? You tracking with me? So, listen to what he says. You, you need to have purpose. Well, what does the purpose need to be? The purpose needs to, to be to the, to the need at hand. So, if I'm going to speak with purpose to the need, then it is upon me to what? I'm sorry? Listen. Listen. You mean if I'm talking to somebody, I need to listen to them? That I really need to be paying attention to them? That I need to be aware of what the need is? I love it. People call me up and they go, Pastor. They'll come up to me and say, Pastor, I got a question. And my response sometimes is, I've got an answer. Let's see if they match. Okay? Because sometimes they don't. I was going down the road the other day. And here comes this. Here comes this, I'm up on this car. I'm doing the speed limit. This car's doing five miles below the speed limit. Okay? So I got to slow down. I'm behind this guy going, okay, you know. He's in the number one lane, and he's doing five. All right, okay, whatever. And then the speed limit drops by 10 miles an hour. You know what he does? Stays the same speed. So he went from being five miles under the speed limit to being five miles over the speed limit. That's okay. He's got one speed. You know, kind of averages out, works for him, you know. If it's, if it's high, he's a little low. If it's low, he's a little high. But we're the same way. We got the same answer. Might fit, might not, might be close, might not. If we're going to speak with purpose to meet the need, we're going to have to listen. 
We can't just have the standard answer. And Christians are good for that. Pastor, I'm struggling. You need to pray about it. Well, pastor, you know, my, my husband, you need to pray about it. You know, well, my, my son, you need to pray about it. Now, look, I'm not belittling prayer. Okay? But sometimes there might be another answer in addition to prayer. But, you know, we don't have time to listen. We're, we're, we're busy. We're, we're preoccupied. We're, we're, we're interrupted. I was, I was working at the house the other day. Here's another confession. Golly. Y'all aren't going to want to come back next week. Okay, because I, I got all sorts of problems. I'm working at the house the other day. Ding dong. Well, at my house it's ding dong. Because I got dogs. Okay. So if you ever come to my house, just ring it once. The dogs will keep going until I answer the door. And, and I go to the door and it's Jehovah's Witness. I can tell immediately it's Jehovah's Witness. Okay. And very sweet, lovely lady, you know. And she says, well, we're just out. It's Easter and people are thinking about the Lord. And I'm thinking... Lady, I got work to do, okay? So I said, are, are you Watchtower? Yes, I'm the pastor of the church. Thank you for your time. Okay? I closed the door. She was very polite. She went on her way. I closed the door and I went, golly, Jim, the Lord brought one to your door. <laughs> but I didn't have time to listen, okay? I need to get about some things. If we're going to speak with purpose to meet the need at hand, then we've got to pay attention. What's the old adage? How many ears do you have? How many mouths do you have? So maybe you ought to listen twice as much as you speak, right? But we don't do that. But I'll tell you, if we're going to be a people that speak words that edify, if we're going to be words that enrich a life, if they're going to be words that honor God, they have to be words that are, that are spoken with purpose, they had to be words that, that, that are spoken aware of the needs of other people. And they need to be words that are well chosen. Well chosen words. That's probably where I get in trouble. Is that I don't always, you know, think about my words. Somebody once told me that you really need to think about what you're going to say. And how it's going to sound. As well as how the other person's going to speak. Or how they're going to receive it. Because sometimes, without doing that, we cannot speak words that enrich to help their needs. Really, what we're speaking are words that are using them to meet our need. Okay? I'm saying what I need to say to make myself feel better, to get back to my, you know, project that I was working on, or whatever else. You ever had, you ever had somebody in a moment of honesty you know you're sharing uh, you know I was watching a movie last night and this scene came on and you know they uh, you know this lady didn't have any clothes on and the person goes oh well, I never would do such a thing you ever, thought, you ever had that happen? okay that's a person that's speaking not to the need of the individual that's a person speaking to their own need. I need to somehow prove to you that I'm better than you are. Okay? I need to somehow prove to you that, that God's right and you're wrong. And I do that by saying, Whoa, that's just a disgusting thing. Preacher walks up on four little boys one day standing around a dog talking. And he hears them all, you know how little boys are. And this dog right in the middle of it. So the pastor walks up and the pastor says to these boys, boys, what you talking about? says, well, we found this dog, and we decided that the one that, that tells the biggest lie gets to keep the dog. So the pastor says, well, I never would do something like that. Here, the dog's yours. <laughs> How many of us are like that, though? You know, I can't tell somebody what they really need to hear because somehow I feel like I need, to, I need to put them in their place. Okay? I'm, if I do that, then I'm using them to meet my need. And I did that last Sunday. I did not choose my words well. And I wanted to make a point about false theology. And I threw Joel Osteen under the bus to do that. Now, please don't get me wrong. 
The prosperity doctrine that is preached in America is a lie. Okay? It's bad orthodoxy. It's bad biblical study. In South Carolina, they would say that dog don't hunt. But I use Joe Olstein for my point. And God wouldn't have done that. So, you know, I want you to understand, I'm not just saying that I made a bad choice. I'm saying I sinned. Why did I sin? Because I did something contrary to the person and the character of God. And you go, well, preacher, if I start getting mindful about that, then I'm in trouble. <laughs> yeah, welcome to the club. We're all in trouble. Because we're all not God. Rather than speaking words that that are harsh or whatever. I need to speak words that edify. And Paul says this. So that it will give grace to those who hear. Now he's not talking about. He's not talking about God given grace. You see that? Right? He's not saying to them. You know. Speak a certain way so that God will give them grace. He says to them. Let your words be of such a character so that it will give grace to those who hear. By how you speak, you can impart grace. Now, don't get high on a horse and think, Woohoo! I have the ability to impart grace. The only grace that you have to impart is because of the presence. If you're a Christ follower, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the only grace you have to impart is because of him in you. But there's still grace that you have to impart. So maybe we need to think about what is grace. Maybe we need to understand a little bit about what grace is because we can't give it if we don't know what it is, right? So I think sometimes we think of grace as being a mindset, like an attitude. Why isn't she so graceful, you know? That's never been said of me because they moved the plants because I'm not graceful. Coming out of the movie last night. I start to fall. She goes, don't fall. <laughs> Gravity works, you know. <laughs> we think of somebody who, is, who, is, who moves well or has a, a gentle disposition. Uh, but that's really, that, that's really not the, the biblical mindset of grace. The biblical mindset of grace is demonstrated by what is said in Acts. Paul says this is in Acts 20, 32. He says, and now I commend you to God. And to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. He says, I commend you. Paul's talking to the elders at the church of Ephesus, the same church. And he's getting ready to travel to Rome. And he's, you remember the scene, he's meeting them at the dock and they're grieving because he says, you know, I just, I don't know what's going to happen, but the Holy Spirit testifies that I'm going to be in chains and all of that. And so he's kind of giving him his, his, his last words. And he says, I, I entrust you to God's grace. He says, a grace that is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance. Grace is not just an attitude. But grace is an empowering action. The grace of God is, and this is the way that I define it. This is my experience of it in scripture. The grace of God is the ability to do what he has called you to do. To be who he has called you to be. That is what grace is. Grace isn't just a thought. But it's, a, it's an action. You don't just, you know, grace somebody. You grace somebody. You don't just bless somebody, speak words over them. But somehow, in the spirit and the working of God, you, you enable God to move and to work. Your words are not just words that are meant to make people feel good. Your words are not just words that should not offend people. Your words should not just be words that make them think well of you. But the words that, that, a, that a, a, a Christian, a disciple of God is to speak are supposed to be words that, that emanate from the heart of God. And hold the potential to affect the life of another person. And what I said didn't do that. Matter of fact, if Joel Steen had heard me, 
If he watched YouTube, because the sermons are online, it probably would have cut his heart. Look at that preacher calling me a liar. That doesn't feel good. That doesn't help him. That cuts him. And understand that the words that you speak, you speak to somebody, or in speaking to somebody, other people over here. So your words hold the potential to affect a lot of lives. So they need to be seasoned with grace. They need to be words that, that emanate from the heart of God. They need to be words that, that are spoken with purpose and intent to, to bless and to enrich and to uplift. They need to be words that, that are seasoned with grace that can bring a person to the realization that life can be different if they, if they let God work in them. Well, the only way they're going to realize that God can work in them is if they hear him working through you. But as James reminds us, that tongue, that tongue's a wicked thing. So easy to throw things out there and so hard to take them back. So I confess to you and I ask your forgiveness for sinning in the words that I said last week. I apologize for causing you to stumble and saying, well look, the preacher can do that, it must be okay. It's not okay. The Bible reminds us, ladies and gentlemen, that by every word we speak, we're going to be judged. Think about that. Every word we speak, you know why I selected that congregational reading today? Because it talks about we're sinners and God forgives. And I realize, I realize as much as I want to speak words that are wholesome, that are edifying, and that are a blessing, that there are times I miss that mark. And I haven't just made bad choices. I've sinned. And I've grieved the heart of my father. And I need to repent. And so I challenge you. I challenge you to think about the words that you speak. I challenge you to think about the people to whom you are speaking. About whether or not the words that are going to come out of your mouth. Are words that are going to be wholesome and enriching. Or if the words that are coming out of your mouth just come out of your mouth with little thought other than whatever happens to fly in. Father, to you we come right now. I thank you so much that you are a God who forgives. I thank you, Father, that you're also a God of grace. A God who empowers us to be the people that you have called us to be, to know you in a way that is knowable. I thank you for that. But Lord, I also pray that you'd help us to realize, above all else, that we're a people that, that need you so much. And that, Lord, we would cast ourselves upon you and let you work in us. And Lord, this we pray because of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.